So I think the leadership style continuously changes. And at this stage, you start finding out that, you know, it's not just empowerment. You have to first build a context. You have to guide people. You have to bring, bring clarity in what they need to do and how they need to deliver results and then empower them. So I think the, the whole idea of your leadership changes that you want to put people in front. Um, you want them to be responsible and accountable, but it cannot be without the context of having very clearly defined what their goals are and how they're going to measure them. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? We all know that talent is very important to the success of our company. We have to be able to create an environment where talent is attracted to. We have to create space for them to grow as leaders. We have to be intentional about creating that space for those people so that they can actually use that talent to move the business forward. We're going to talk about growing by attracting the right talent. What are the things that you have to be paying the attention to? How do you shape the company in such a way that the right talent wants to come here? We also talk about some of the details of leadership today. Our guest is the founder of General Informatics. They're a six-time Inc. winner. They are really in a powerful company inside the uh, technology space. The founder of Informatics is Mohit Vij. And that's a difficult name for me to pronounce, but I wanted to share this with you because the interview I had with Mo, we'll call him, is really a powerful one. And there's some details inside here that I think you're going to want to tune into. One of them is what happens if you're in a meeting and some new person to the company or an outsider doesn't know you're the CEO? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Inside today's interview, you'll find out exactly why that's important inside your journey of leadership. Before we dive into that, I want to make sure that you have already tuned into the free training we have. I talk about this a good bit on the podcast because I'm really proud of this training about helping you become the leader your employees crave by addressing the three mistakes that are often come up inside of growing a company and scaling it fast. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash training. When you think about leadership, I want you to think about this training and about what does it take for you to show up to be the leader that your team craves. Go to genehammett.com forward slash training. Now here's the interview with Mo. Before we dive into the interview, I wanted to remind you that you can actually get a tool that I've been working with clients with for the last couple of years. I've refined this tool that's gone through several iterations. Now we have it completely automated. You can actually go online and fill out the leadership quiz to get the leadership quiz, just go to theleadershipquiz.com. That's pretty easy, right? Theleadershipquiz.com. What you will get when you do that is you will answer a few questions. You will see where you rate based on the core principles of fast growth companies. If you're ready to grow your company or you want to see where you are, then make sure you go to theleadershipquiz.com. Inside it, you will get insight to where you are, understand where you want to improve, and you will get them mapped into the 10 areas that are most specific to fast growth companies. Again, go to theleadershipquiz.com and you can get that right now. Mo, how are you? Hi, how are you, Jay? Fantastic. Excited to have you on the podcast to talk about growth and leadership. Tell us about general informatics. Sure. So we were an IT services company, but we've been, you know, um, and right out of school, I felt like we could do a we could re-engineer the corporations. That was a hot book at that time. And uh, we said, okay, with my degrees in operations research and computer science, I said, okay, this is a right talent thing for me to take on and uh, realized I couldn't sell it as good. So, and wherever we tried to do sell the re-engineering uh, concept, they wanted us to come and fix their computers and or the servers. And so we kind of pivoted and where the demand was, we started, I mean, Rough us setting up networks and things like that, and then managing and then completely becoming an IT department for a lot of companies. You know, we didn't go into this because I didn't understand that background from you, but uh, operations research is something I studied in school. Wow. I, was, I was a studying, um, and I didn't practice either. I think they, they made me promise and signed that I would not actually do the work. But uh, I was an industrial engineer from Georgia Tech. Oh, I'm an industrial engineer too. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> The things we find out uh, when we turn this on. So 
I know our team has done some research with you. Um, the company's you know, been around for a long time, 2001. You had shared with me you're an accidental uh, founder. How does yeah. that happen? Well, it was, I was working for a company here and, you know, and we uh, started re-engineering some of their concepts and they, uh, you know, you can guess from my accent originally from India and came here for graduate studies. And uh, so the day I got my green card, they said, well, if you start a company, we want to be your first client. And I hadn't thought about it until then. I was like, sure, I can start a business. So, and it kind of, and then, like you said, 9-11 happened. And um, so we started in 2001, but really didn't start till 2004. I was the only employee of the company for three years. And then, so we always say we started a company in 2004. Well, I appreciate us going that far back. Right now, you're sitting at about 80 employees. You're continuously uh, growing the company, which is impressive. You've been on the ink list six times. What is one thing you've learned about leadership that is that has evolved as you've grown through this, this company? That's not one of the questions I got. I know it's not one of the questions. <laughs> but no, so uh, I think the key is like any small business you start, you, you feel you can do something and then you bring people in to help you and assist you. And it takes a while, then you start hearing empower people and then you empower people and that doesn't work well. And so I think the leadership style continuously changes. And at this stage, you start finding out that you know it's not just empowerment, you have to first build a context. You have to guide people. You have to bring, bring clarity in what they need to do and how they need to deliver results and then empower them. So I think the, the whole idea of your leadership changes that you want to put people in front. Um, you want them to be responsible and accountable, but it cannot be without the context of having very cl clearly defined what their goals are and how they're going to measure them. Hold on for a second. Mo just talked about empowering people. Let me put a spotlight on empowerment right now. The, the idea of empowering people is the opposite of micromanagement. The right talent doesn't want to be micromanaged. In fact, they will leave under those circumstances. So what is empowerment? Well, one part of empowerment is letting people share their ideas, letting people openly talk about opportunities to uh, solve a problem, let them create value for themselves, let them create um, and brainstorm together it doesn't have to be always your ideas that win. In fact, the strongest companies are built on a foundation of the CEO and the founders are not the ones coming up with the ideas and the strategies, but the employees are. A second piece of this sense of empowerment is letting them make decisions, empowering them to, to have those ideas and follow through with it. Make those decisions so that they know that you have confidence in them, you trust them. Over time, what you will get is people that are willing to make those decisions when you're not in the room. So. When you think about um, the growth of the company, getting to 80 and people, a lot of people go, they don't even want a company that big, but you have found that you've, one of the key elements of this is the right talent. Um, we all need, know we need to have talent. You're in the, the, the IT world. We need those talented, skilled people that understand strategy and the, the execution of these things. Um, how do you make sure you're getting the right talent? So I think first is we're in a, um, you're, you're always in a community part of a locality. And you know, it's important to have the right image. First of all, the right people should apply or get to you, you know, or you approach the right people. So it was important to create an image of our company as the, the innovation leader locally here. And you know, it was hard in IT services, which is very generic area. So we started working some software and started doing some cool things. So locally here, we're, you know, so when it comes to innovation, I think people would generally think of our company first. So in that sense, number one, the, we create the right marketing for the talent. And then second is every employee at General Informatics knows that you know, we encourage them to find the person they would want to work with. So everybody's always hiring. And that's how, you know, so we always continuously interviewing people, trying to see if we can find the right fit. I think between those two things, I think it helps. Are you, did you say that you're getting a lot of your, your new talented people from the inside of the company? They're identifying their friends or they're in, within their network and they're telling them this is a great place to work. We're innovative and you should come, should come work here. Is that kind of the way it works? Absolutely. And, you know, even and not just telling people, of course, just they have their own interest in it because, you know, we tell them that who do you want to work with? Because once you get the right crop coming in, and they don't want to be, nobody, I mean, everybody says, uh, nobody wants to carry unnecessary weight, right? So they try to get the right people. And then we also encourage them financially in some sense, you know, and many companies do it, but there is some little 
award or something if you get so many good people in the company. So that helps. Kind of curious here, Mo, what would you share with us about, you know, things that you've learned along that journey of hiring people's quote unquote friends and letting them come in? Is there anything that you've, mistakes maybe you've made that you've had to, to address? Yeah, sometimes it gets personal. And if you don't hire somebody's friend, you know, even the existing employees get a little offended on that, that, you know, I mean, I brought you a great guy. And second is, you know, sometimes they want to bring their girlfriend in and, uh, you know, that's not the best fit. And so we've had absolutely those things. And uh, so you have to be a little balanced. Uh, you have to, you know, initially we tried to kind of see that it's not just them bringing the friends in. The, the new uh, candidates need to qualify on certain basis, certain uh, aspects before we get them in. Now, I want to throw you for a loop here because this is not in your pre-planned questions, uh, but hopefully it's a pretty big layup. A lot of, I think, IT companies see that you have to have certain skills to do the work, whether it be you know, hardware skills, software skills, application development skills, integration skills. Um, where do you come down on selecting the right people when it comes to culture fit for the company? Yeah, no, that's a, so, and I think that's part of the grow, leadership journey for myself or our senior management team too, that initially it was a very skill-based hiring. And then we realized that it's not so much about skills, it's really the attitude. And when we say attitude, in fact, you know, in our company values, that's one of the first thing we say, the person needs to have the right attitude. And, um, and culture starts playing, so we realize that, you know, if you're not a fit in the culture, no matter how skilled you are, or you're not gonna succeed. So in that sense, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, and you know, I think part of the attitude is just for letting these, these people know that you are in a field which is very, I mean, you're a global competition here, you know, connected to internet. So it's not, you need to understand that part and you need to understand that, you know, unless I deliver results in the end, it's not gonna work out. So the attitude in that case is really is that it's not gonna be that I'm doing eight to five every day is working. I mean, eight to five is good if you give solid six hours in, you know, in a day, but if you're not, it's about results in the end. So, so you know, that culture, I mean, now if the skills are not there, people learn. We brought people, I mean, to give you an idea, we interviewed somebody, he had never done programming. We were looking for a programming job. He was a math teacher. And, you know, I mean, so we just basically asked him to write some algorithms, how they would do in just pure English. And just seeing how he wrote, we put him in touch with another software developer for a month, gave him some plural side courses to take. He's one of our most, you know, one of the best programmers we have today. So there's, so skills are still trust. Second is also as a company, I think if we have structured our processes better, uh, we don't have, you know, just do anything or everything, then it's easier to bring people in into the right path. So that helps. What uncommon approaches have you taken as a leader to try to create a place where this, this right talent can really flourish? First is they should know what are they doing. It's very important that you know they people find uh, that what the work they are doing is important, and it's important by the company, and it's important by uh, your clients, and in, often our clients end up being our community. So till they understand that you know that what they're doing is important becomes important, and then um, then they they're more vested in it. And second is um, I think if we align them with a the group, it's almost that you know uh, tribal mentality that you say okay your success or your failure is not just your success failure, it's a failure or success of your team. So creating that bond between them and that their team becomes also very important for us early on. So the people feel more responsible that it's not just gonna be about company, it's the close group of people they hang out with need to succeed due to what they're doing. So I think that helps. Mo, when you think about your journey as a leader, give us a, kind of a, a picture of a defining moment where something really shaped who you are today? You know, I'm kind of one of those leaders who essentially is like, if you're taking too long, I'll do it. Okay. You know, who wants to jump in and it's very difficult to trust people to say, okay, you can do it right. And I think that was an impediment in our growth too. We talked about, you know, that how the first few millions, uh, that mentality can work, that attitude can work and you're just working hard and you're bringing a lot of help in. And then after a while, you get to a, uh, to a place where you realize things have to change. And you know, that's where I think the whole process of empowerment of people comes in. 
And luckily for us, we acquired a company at, it, at that stage. And it was a good understanding. It was kind of, you know, when you see by example, you saw that the leader of the company became our VP and came in. And I realized that he could run his own division completely without, you know, by getting in or helping and it was doing well. And that was a kind of eye opener that it's not necessary. It's just, you know, that if you have the right systems in place and you have clarity of what other person's goals are, and actually you're selecting the right person too, but even if you take a little while with them, but, but very clearly hand holding them, you're coaching them. And that leadership style, I think that was a moment for me changing how I led the company after that. And I said, okay, I'm going to take a back seat here. And, you know, and one of the tests became that if somebody comes from outside, will they find out in a meeting who the CEO of the company is? And if they can, then you've succeeded. And, uh, and so, you know, we would always be in the front and I started taking the back seats in our meetings and just letting people speak and, but always giving them feedback about what happened. So I think that kind of started changing our culture as a company. Hold on for a second. Mo just talked about the, the tendency to think, I'll just do it. Now, what does that mean inside of our companies? Well, in the early days, it means you've got the ideas of how you're going to move forward. But if you're the only one coming up with ideas, if you're the only one solving problems, this can actually be very dangerous. I fell into this pattern when I grew my first business. I tried to resist doing it now, but you wanna let your employees do it instead of you thinking you can do it. I'm not doubting the fact that you could probably do it quicker, but eventually you will have to let go of that. And I'm gonna encourage you to go ahead and look at all of the things that you could be letting go and how, who you would assign them to. There's some frameworks I use inside my coaching that I would just urge you to think about this today is all of the things that you say, I'll just do it, is to really look at that and examine it for a second and look at what, what you're afraid of. Look at who you could actually give this to and really think about it and reflect if, if you continue to do those things, when will they learn to do it for themselves? Oh, I can't let you just pass that bias. I think it's a very interesting element there. Inside the meeting, if a new person could not determine who the CEO was, uh, you feel like that's success. I and and, that and is, I get the concept, but I want to make sure our audience is clued, in, clued into exactly what you mean by that. So take it a little bit deeper. Sure. So, you know, I, so I didn't do it as a, as, a, as a goal, but it was interesting because we had a meeting and we have some of our clients came in. They had never met me. And, um, and we were doing a demo of a software and they kept asking questions uh, to one of our uh, you know, senior engineers and I mean, he's very articulate and everything. And till the end of the meeting, they basically told me that they thought he was a CEO. And <laughs> I felt, in a way, I was like, really? But I also felt good that, you know, that they couldn't uh, un realize who the person who was leading the whole uh, show here. And that was a good thing for me because it meant I could take more vacations now, right? So, but that was a good point. And then we said, okay, if, if our people are able to perform, especially when clients can come in and they can go over the whole thing and introduce a company and everything, then I think it's not a single leader. It's, 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 a, lead, it's a company led by leaders, you know, and kind of thing. So that became almost an asset test for myself personally that, okay, we need to be there and I need to be in the, one of the people sitting in the audience at that time and see how it goes. You know, this is a concept that I think a lot of founders are looking to get to. They're looking to, to really grasp. They no longer have to be in the meetings. They are there because they, they want to be a part of it, but they don't have to be. Sure. And that's kind of what you're describing, Mo, is you being able to sit back and letting the team step up to talk about the issues, um, talk about the, the way we're going to move forward, what, you know, prioritize the different things. And you're able to just sit there and, and maybe even just be a part of it and not just be the person who directs it. That's Absolutely. a big change. Absolutely. But you know, you, for the journey there too, because initially it was not, it's very hard to stay quiet when somebody, something is being said, you can improve on that, right? So we realized that the, in, the key thing was, like I said in the beginning, was having everybody on the same page and aligned, which means really sharing at least your strategy, sharing your, sharing your goals and the vision uh, more in a tangible way with the, with the employees. I want to give you another one of those easy questions here. We've been talking about the right team and leadership. Is there anything else that you feel like has been, you know, critical as the company has grown, you know, over 12 million and, and hit the ink list more than six times? Well, that's 
Well, that was last year. We've done better this year. So I will be probably be there as to the seventh time this year. So I think our numbers are looking much better this year. Uh, so we are, uh, so in that sense, I think it's, you know, yeah, we, we defined our strategy again. So, you know, we said, okay, so it's almost important to see um, when you need to, I wouldn't say pivot is a more extreme thing. You don't need to pivot, but you need to realign and, you know, with times change some of the things you're doing. And uh, I think you get into new markets as your size grows, you are able to see new things and that opens up new opportunities. So you almost want to make sure that you are tuning your strategy, not very often, but to, you know, as you see some new inputs coming in that you know, the company is aligned to take advantage of the new opportunities coming. Well, I appreciate that. That's probably well, uh, a good place to stop today because we have to realign to our strategy. Sometimes we have to actually recast our vision um, given what we've all been through, through this coronavirus and everything. Mo, I really appreciate you being here on the show and sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much, Gene. I love talking about attracting the right talent. Attracting the right talent is, involves so many things around just the environment and creating a space for opportunity. Today, we talked about some of the key elements behind that, but one of them is being the right leader for the right talent. You've got to be a strong, influential leader. You've got to have a vision and you've got to be able to align people together. The better you are at that, the more likely you can attract the talent that you need to move the business forward. And you can marshal those resources to be aligned to a shared vision. All of those things are part of leadership. One of the things I love to do is work with leaders to help them through the defining moments of their leadership. If you haven't already gotten the free training, make sure you go to genehammett.com forward slash training. If you want to have a conversation with me about your leadership or a challenge you're facing, I'd love to get to know you. Send me an email, gene at genehammett.com.